prototype for a brass snare, which, which they haven't developed yet. Oh, great. I was not checking it out. It feels pretty good. I've always been trying to get them to make a, a, a brass snare drum, and I think they're right on the way to do it. I think it's on my own. Nice tone for it, too. Um, so let's see. So we talked about some tunes. You guys heard of the, uh, the, the let's see what's on the radio, the David Lee Roth tunes? Anybody yeah. heard of those yeah. tunes? Yeah. California Girls or? Just a Gigolo. Yeah, don't remind me. I'm just a Gigolo. Yeah, yeah so we, <laughs> I did those, and uh, those are going right back to basics. Uh, back to regular stock shuffles, four to the floor, kicking the band. A lot of the, uh, 
space where I'm coming from usually is groove oriented. Oh, great. Yeah, I'm sorry. And uh, most everything I do is related to some sort of a groove through everybody's uh, personal feeling, uh, however you feel, so you can create your own style through the statements you make in a groove. Uh, I stress simplicity over uh, complexness. In, in, uh, for example, um, basic ways to start out, in which you guys all know, I'm sure, which would be just a straight, plain, one and three in the bass drum, two and four in the snare, and uh, I usually do, instead of straight eighths, I accent the eighths by using the shank part of the t uh, stick and the bead. By doing that, it's so you, what you hear basically is uh, quarter notes, but then you hear the soft eighth note in the ends. like that is the, the whole my whole motto is less is more and in production and when you play on people's records the producer would rather have less amount of fills and drums in in spaces where there might be vocals or uh, you know some sort of a synth part or a guitar line that, that would be more musical so the, the correct way to think would be musically and simplistically um, so when you just maybe let's say have a pattern that's simple you want to come up with maybe one addition to it by going. Whatever it does, it's still dancing. And that's my, the thing I always stress is, can people dance? Assuming it's a dance record. If it's not a dance record, then everything's open to negotiations. But, um, and another example, uh, would be the tune we did with Rufus and Shaka, Ain't Nobody. Oh, yeah. And this, yeah. this tune was different because it started a trend of tunes that you heard a lot of clones on the radio. You heard, uh, you know, everybody programming drum machines like that groove was, which was real drums. So the way we did that groove uh, was I, I kind of cheated in a sense. I used technology to its fullest and recorded the snare and the bass drum first. However, I'll show you how everything fits together in a sec. The snare and the bass drum pattern, the snare of course was on two and four. Bass drum pattern was... And oddly enough, the bass part, with that anticipated note, the bass part didn't go with that bass drum. Usually everybody thinks when the tunes play together, the bass and the bass drum should be locked. This was an example where they were totally off and they happened to work in like a glove. So by adding the hi-hat part, the hi-hat part was... don't involve three sixteenths in a row. So I, once I, uh, I got the grip of that, and it, it just everything locked in real nice. Mm. Um, some other tunes that are relatively simple, but it involves just you know, a dancing technique and groove would be All Night Long, Lionel Richie. And this was done very simply. Abraham Laboreal played bass. And uh, because of him, it was just you know, very magical. And he has that feel that, that just locked me right into it. The whole verse pattern was really simple. And the chorus.
back to basics. Everything's real simple. You know, another clone tune of that was, is what's on the radio now is um, a Rhythm of the Night by DeBarge. And that's a kind of a, I call it a clone tune because they, they used exact, myself and Abraham, they did the exact same part, more or less, with a different tune. And it made the top five, so that was, that was good for the writer anyway. <laughs> um, let's see. As far as uh, getting back to basics, which I just skipped over, but uh, you know, when I play grip and hold my sticks, I play from a fulcrum aspect, which I, I'm, I'm not sure the method they teach here, but I'm pretty sure it's probably the same, is I, I have my thumb and forefinger together, thumbs up all the time, and I have my fingers always around the sticks and, and do that sort of motion. And the match grip the same way, left-handed, exactly the same way. When I play in the right symbol, it's the exact same way. If I go over to the hi-hat, the hi-hat is approached from the same aspect. Instead of palm down, I play thumb up. Same with the right symbol. In a swing mode, uh, the correct way I look at playing the ride cymbal is you swing your arm out on one and three, keep the bead at the same position on the cymbal. By going, so when you get to up tempos and, and uh, tempos that are real hard to play, use your arm as the motion, like, like a whipping motion, but make sure the bead stays in the same spot of the cymbal, unless, of course, you want to alter it you know, for a different tonality. So, yeah. I stress back to uh, don't ever forget your swing roots. You know, there's everybody so we're all locked up into this. You know, and I should be one to talk because I'm a, I'm a groove maniac. I, I think nothing yeah. but grooves. But I also think about back in the 30s and the 40s when we weren't here. Everybody was going, you know, which was grooving hard then. And uh, we can still learn a lot from those you know, those lessons of the old swing and uh, how, you know, how those drummers play, how drummers like Elvin then took uh, the grooves and, and opened them up and got off four on the floor and started doing other, other things. So this, you know, leads into, into drummer styles today, which are, are so wide and varying, and there's always room for any other drummer in here to have a, a new, unique style. My whole thing that I stress is time. I feel that, uh, in today's music and what's happened, everybody should have time uh, of their internal clock. Everybody's got their own heart and their own time. Some people rush a little, some people drag a little, some people are right on the money. My whole thing is you try, you should have to memorize all three aspects of that time by being able to play way on the back side of the backbeat instead of just, you know. So it sounds like a machine. That, that bugs me. You want to be able to, to lay the same thing back. Uh, the same thing with playing on top of the beat. Uh, learning how to play different things where they may be, because of the, what's happening or the tempo, be able to play um, just slightly on top of the beat but not rushing. So maybe the, the, it feels right or that's the type of song it is. You know, maybe a samba or things that need to be kicked up. Um, but my whole uh, basic point lies from everybody's inner clock and where your time lies. I think that's partially why I, I get a lot of work is because my time is very accurate and I can play it with a click track, which I, I don't ever let intimidate me. When you guys get out there, and I'm sure a lot of you already are working with drum machines. Is everybody here familiar with drum machines? And, 
and clicks. You get a chance to do that? Yeah. yeah. Clicks sometimes. First time I, I saw a click was at, it was at Berkeley College of Music where I went. And they had a little eight track studio at that time there. And uh, they had a digital click. And I says, wow, you know, I'd never played with a click before. So they put it in the phones, and sure enough, you just, you know, sat and played with it. And it was fun. You know, I didn't get intimidated by it, or, uh, you know, there was no horror stories like I hear. So um, you have to learn how to be able to program it, you know, uh, play with it, learn how to play with a, a complete orchestra or a band with this click still happening in your head. In addition to that, taking all that away, do the exact same thing without the click, and as if it were there, which is your own heart. So what you have to do is make sure that you are locked with the click track. And now, 90, I'd say 95% of all records cut today are cut with machines. Even though you don't hear them, they're still there. They're all cut with machines. You know, like a Roger Lynn drum machine or some sort of a new uh, RX-11 or something you know, by Yamaha. Um, I just finished an album produced by Michael Lamartian uh, for Christopher Cross. And he hasn't had a record out in three years. And this album is going to be ridiculous. It's all rock and roll. It's a total 180 turn for him. And it's just a four-piece rhythm section. But everything we cut was all cut with a DMX and me playing with the DMX. And, and it allowed, it, I had to listen to congas all the time and uh, some sort of a hi-hat pattern all the time and, and in things that were all syncopated in addition to kicking the band off and, uh, and then creating all my element uh, for the record. But I think when, you know, when it comes out, there'll be very little machine in there. And the drums were huge. We used, you know, room mics. And I've been uh, really trying to master uh, micing drums in the correct way and different aspects of room and uh, things that just make a straight drum sound huge. And that's the, the magic of electronics in the studio. Um, getting into different types of mics, um, on the bass drums, we usually use like Sennheiser 421s, or RE20s, or a, uh, maybe a C500 Sony. On the snare drum, I usually like one mic only, and that's a Shure 57, just a little cheap $60 mic, which uh, most, most drummers use. Uh, sometimes, if you're going for a bright, metallic sound, a lot of rock and roll <coughs> is recorded with uh, like a... Uh, AKG 452, which is a brighter pin mic, and the same for the hi-hat, usually use that on hi-hat. Uh, you want to get the brightness, the most brightest sound possible out of the cymbals in the studio. Um, a, lot of, a lot of the sounds on records, and a lot of people get, you know, they, sometimes they get depressed because when they play live, it, it can't sound as possibly as good as that, you know, on the record. But it, it, it really can, um, just, you know, knowing and, and learning how to tune correctly. Uh, in, in the tuning, when I tune my bass drums, this is not my studio set, but when I tune my bass drums, I, I use always Remo coated heads, ambassadors. And I use a, a little uh, bass drum muffler by Danmar. I use a square wood beater on the bass drum. And uh, I have a custom uh, rod made out of titanium instead of steel because steel always bends after about 10 minutes of play through the heat. So I have a titanium one made with a Caroline pedal. When I, when I play the bass drum, I play heel down all the time. And when I was a kid and playing, and Ed Sof kind of got me out of this habit, I used to play with the toe all the time. And I had a lot of chops, but the time was terrible. And uh, so I went through about a three or four year uh, transition around 15 years old to try to get myself to play back the, the correct way. And I always, I always preach that the correct way is with the heel down all the time and releasing the beater off the head, as, just as though you play a, a snare. You pull the sound out of the drum instead of... Just, it's only logical. It's the same way with the bass drum. Instead of going... Um, what you want to do is take... If you don't play this way, at least give it a try. You know, sometimes years and years of playing with the toe, you can't play with the heel and vice versa. So I would suggest if you've got, you know, like a Ted Reed syncopation book or any sort of book with a, with a 
exercise that has uh, syncopation in it. Go through it and try to play it all heel down at different tempos and different volumes. Now to the hi-hat, I play the exact opposite. I play always toe. Unless it's some sort of a soft tune where I'll just, I'll just play heel down and lift, and lift it up. Or if I, if I release the cymbals like that, I'll play heel down. But for the speed and everything and the accuracy, you have to be able to play um, toe down usually. And uh, that basically covers it. On the, on my, uh, as far as drum heads go on, in the studio, I can just show you the snare. For example, on, the, on We Are The World, I use this snare drum here. This is a custom Yamaha 9-inch drum, which you can't buy, but and Jim Coffin would kill me. But you can buy an 8-inch version of this, which is exactly the same drum, and it can be tuned exactly the same way. This drum is this, from where I left it last. Oh. And my tuning is basically Remo coated head on the top. I use a, uh, a little dinner napkin I stole from somewhere. <laughs> and then I got a little, just a Rogers clip on here. And my tuning is basically like a tenor drum. Pretty even. The bottom tuning is uh, about medium, medium high for this drum. Even though it sounds pretty dark in here, but uh, it's it's not real tight. But it's just tight enough. And uh, to to get that fat sound, I use a, like the mic, just like this, a Shure 57. Put it right over the edge, and it brings out all the all the great qualities of a drum in the studio, and and live, of course, too. And, and then, for example, uh, for um, a lot of the rock and roll things I do, like on the David Lee Roth things, I use the, the old traditional Ludwig Black Beauty. This has been modified slightly with uh, Pearl hardware, so it's you know, a little bit better restraint. I usually run it wide open, no muffling. Crazy. <laughs> now this one here, I need to work with a little bit. I decided to spring on you guys. I think this will make it. I think this will be a good drum for the studio. It's got it's got enough depth. It's got a lot of ring. I haven't tuned it up real high yet, like a piccolo tuner, but I think. Uh, you know, what I've been doing in the studio lately is, is really going against what's natural and going for the bizarre effects and trying to tune things very, very, very high and using different echoes and miking techniques uh, for maybe like miking a snare drum far away instead of close miking it and hitting it. And then what, what's reproduced is something different and it's, you know, very similar to like old bottom stuff, you know, real trashy and... Uh, <laughs> kind of nice. <laughs> Instead of that tight sound all the time, you know. I had enough of that tight sound, so I'm always trying to expand and, and change, you know, within the realm of, of my style. And everybody else should, should consider always being on top of every aspect of everything, which includes, you know, drum machines and being able to program drum machines. You guys, everybody here, uh, do they take piano courses here, or uh, the drummers don't take piano? I stress that. I, I, I know that uh, it's an extra hour or so a day or a couple hours a week, but I think piano is very, very important in what you hear musically on the drums. And, and even, though, even if you can just play a, a, a C triad or a C scale, you know, learn, learn what to do with that and try to you know, make that happen on the same way to your drums. Approach your drums from a melodic musical standpoint. So. Um, even the simplest thing that you play can be melodic and magical and, and, and help make the groove uh, happen. And let's see if there's anything else I see to cover. Um, I don't know. Let's, uh, let's open it up for some questions here. Has anybody got any questions? Yeah. yeah. On the song All Night Long, is that, that percussion introduction, is that synthesizer or is that percussion? How did that come back? Because I saw Lionel Richie in concert and they used the synthesizer to create that uh, there were, uh, I think I had eight bars 
out rest before I came in, there was um, he was playing a DX1 Yamaha synthesizer with a percussion sound, I think like a marimba sound, and then um, then I came in with a hi hat, only the hi hat. I don't know what they did live. I didn't see him live, but uh, I came in with a hi hat, and then right after that I, came, I brought the bass drum in, and then and then the verse started. So and then Paulinho Picasso was playing uh, percussion at that time for it. So. Um, I know he had at least four tracks of, of overdubs, including Timbales and uh, <coughs> Cowbell and probably a shaker. So I don't really, to answer your question, I, I don't know. I think it was probably a DX1. Yeah. Have you done a lot of marching dropping in the past? When I was young, yeah. I, I, uh, yeah, I, I, I'm real fond of the street aspect of drumming and, and that old uh, style. I came from Iowa. I'm from a town in Iowa called Creston. Dubuque? A little small town. and. Uh, uh, we, I was in the marching band, you know, and I had a bunch of little drummers around me, and we were always playing. And the football coaches always used to come up and say, "How come the big guys that like you wasn't playing football?" I says, "You ever get in the marching band? You know, we used to sweat harder than the football players did. You know, I mean, we we wrote, I rewrote all the cadences and made them real funky, you know. And, and, and especially in the Midwest, that was kind of a, you know, a rarity. So that was that was fun. Yeah, I love the marching band. How'd you get so funky? And who'd you?" Listen to God made me funky. Who'd you listen to growing up? Uh, You're very soulful. I I listened to um, I used to listen to Dave Clark. <laughs> you know, I used to listen to him. I used to listen to the Beach Boys, and then I got into Buddy Rich. You know, and I went to the Buddy Rich syndrome. You know, where everything's real real quick and syncopated and double stroke and everything. And then. Um, you know, from listening to Buddy, I got into listening to small jazz groups and things. And uh, I started playing at eight, and I started my first band at ten. And the kind of things we were doing were, you know, ventures and and uh, old cream material and um, you know, just real raw rock and roll stuff. And, and it's maybe some, you know, some Motown tunes. But in Iowa, we didn't really have access to a lot of the, the soul. And that's surprisingly, that's a that's a good question because I don't know. It's just I've just been blessed, you know. I'm real fortunate to be able to, yeah. to have a concept of of what uh, John, people like. Yeah. So yeah. I was to work with Quincy Jones. Oh, he's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> Quincy is magnificent. Yeah. He's uh, he's the reason, part of the reason why uh, I've gotten over in this town. When I first joined Rufus in 1978, uh, they were kind of they were out in the road, and uh, they saw me playing in a club. And uh, saw me came right up in the front row and started watching me play. And, and they had another drummer at the time, and uh, they immediately got me after the show and said, "You know, would you like to join the band?" And I says, "Yeah," because I had, I was in Boston at that time and was looking for a way to get to L.A. And that just happened to open up at the right time. So I moved to L.A. and uh, went out and finished the tour and came back in the studio. And then Quincy, uh, through our management, decided to produce Master Jam, the the Rufus Shock album, in 1979. And after that, Quincy said, John, do you do dates? And I says, yeah. <laughs> so he called me in to overdub over uh, two Michael Jackson songs, which I didn't know, you know, I didn't, you know, I didn't know Michael Jackson was going solo at that time. It was a long time ago. So I overdubbed over two B-sides, uh, Girlfriends and uh, It's the Falling in Love on the Off the Wall album. And then he liked what I did, so he called me back the next Monday and said, would you like to come back and play with the rhythm checks? And I, I said, sure. So I came back, and it was myself, um, Greg Fillingaines, and and David Williams, I think, at that time. Just three of us. There was Lewis wasn't there at that time. And so that's that's how it started with Quincy. What is your musical background? Um, I have a lot of... Uh, I started piano at seven and uh, didn't practice nearly enough. Now I'm making up for it now because it's so much harder to play piano when you're older. Um, and I started drumming at eight and I, I was, you know, played a lot of big band in Iowa. We had a big band when I was you know, I was 12 years old and I was playing with all these adults, you know, like uh, Jim Oates, uh, who used to play with Bill Chase's band and a whole bunch of different people. And uh, then once and I started playing jazz and stuff around, you know, 14, 15 around Iowa, and then I went to Berkeley at 18. And right then I had met, you know, different, so many different types of players that uh, it just opened up my brain to things that I wasn't really aware of. And, um, you know, things about like polyrhythms, which, you know, you really didn't know what they were. And, 
until a teacher had explained them to you. And I mean, you did know, but you really did, couldn't explain it. And now, you know, the things I learned from that were uh, basically um, I have a jazz background and rock and roll, jazz and rock and roll, kind of a weird combination. <laughs> On Steve Perry's song on, on the We Are the World album, you've seen a lot of in between bell stuff, in between your 16th note pattern on the hi hat. Was that done right on the first or on the take, or was that overdose? There was, uh, there also was a D DMX drum machine going through that tune. Did you hear that? Yeah. Yeah, my, my, I think what I was playing on that was just hi hat with the right hand 16th notes and cross stick for most of the tune. And then I went to the deep snare. Uh, for for the end, and, and then I went to the, you know, as I call this a Steve Gadd pattern, even though I use it most of the time. I use this pattern a lot. What are you doing? Know, I always like that pattern because it's very fluid and it has just the top and the bottom and the middle of, of drumming. Yeah. Speaking of Steve Gadd, I noticed that when you were doing your solo, you did a uh, section of Night Sprite. Yeah, you heard it? Yeah. yeah. And I was wondering if you could go with it real slow because for nine years now, I'm trying to figure it out. And I still don't get it out. You want to play the record at 16. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Chick Corea, man. He's a yeah. genius. Yeah. Uh, Night Sprite. This, uh, the intro, first off, was uh, start out with a five stroke roll. It goes. record sounds like this now because I played it so much. <laughs> but, yeah, any other questions? You're a, a left foot bass drum. What technique do you use on that? Heel down? The opposite of my right because uh, it's uh, a little new addition. I've always wanted to play double bass drums when I was playing live. I usually never got the opportunity to. So I usually play toe, strictly toe. And I use an opposite pedal. I use a Yamaha 7 series pedal over here because it just feels right for the left foot. And uh, I tried using, I use a Caroline over here, and I tried to use a Caroline over here, and I just couldn't play at all. So, um, got something in, a, in my transition uh, I'm using. And I usually play toe, so I'm, I'm incorrect when I talk about the right foot. So when I play over here, it's, it's different from toe. Uh, normally when you're playing or soloing, are you thinking, are you thinking of a melody or a rhythm or a click or what? What do you think? Not click normally. That usually I don't think ever of a pulse. I, I mean, I feel the pulse internally and don't think about it. Once you start thinking about the pulse, you'll start get, getting thrown off. So uh, I usually think of a melody, uh, and I'll embellish that melody somewhat, and take it to maybe throughout a form of a tune. You think of a melody, you think of form. And then if there's, of course, tempo change, then you think of, of a, a tempo thing too. So melody and form. Yeah. When you were playing your double bass, it seemed a lot like you were just using like you use a hi hat, except every now and then it would fall off the right bass. What kind of exercise do you do in double bass? Um, that's a good question. When when I get a chance to practice, which isn't that much, which I would you know I really regret because I'm working all the time. But um, basically, you do you know sixteenths, <laughs> sixteenths, uh, you know alternating. You can do double strokes between them. 
do exercises with the, with the toms or you know in a snare drum and uh, uh, you know, maybe maybe three beats per per uh, per uh, foot. The same thing, you know, the same type of exercises I use, like um, on the snare drum, for example. Um, different warm-up exercises. One is just paradiddles, using a single, double, triple, and then backwards, double, single, by going. Uh, It would be. And then, of course, I can't play that fast with the feet, but you try to you try to do things that are uh, coherent about that. Yeah. At what point in your career did you decide that simplicity was where it's at? I mean, you said you started with jazz. And That's a good point. Um, there, was a, there was a point back in uh, 77 and 8 where I was really Billy Cobb and out. You know, I was playing 30-second notes through the toms, and you know, I had a whole array of toms. And uh, I, w I would assume, right after I met Rufus, and they kind of ran me through the mill a little bit and tried to uh, maybe educate me as far as where the, Bobby and Tony especially, where their, their groove lie, you know, or laid, I mean. And uh, then I met Quincy, and Quincy used to say, he used to say, J.R., you're dancing too much. In other words, you're playing too much shit. You know, so, so cool it back and just lay the basics down. So I, I would do that, and he would, he would say, yeah, that's what I want, that's what I want. And then what was funny is like, a, does everybody remember tune I Know Corita from yeah. the D album? Yeah. There was like five overdubs I did on that alone, in, in addition to the basic drum part, which was real difficult. And um, that was like a 12-page chart, one of these impossible, looked like a Canton chart. And um, it, it got to a point where when we, we used to go out and play live with Quincy, you know, we played like 90,000 seat places. Quincy wouldn't want me to play all the parts, like there was a swish caught, you know, on, on the end of, of two and all these different parts. He just wanted me to lay it down real straight and hard. You know, because to keep the keep the groove there and some simplicity there for the uh, for the, the audience. So there's things that you have to learn how to adjust to. To uh, you know, what, maybe something's this way once and it may not be that way again. You know, so you have to learn how to bend a little bit. Yeah. How'd you come up with the uh, classic intro to "Rock with You" on like Michael Jackson? <laughs> you mean? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Kind of stupid, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's used everywhere. Yeah, it is. Uh, I think about that a lot. I mean, you know, <laughs> but uh, that was a collaboration of myself and Rod Temperton, the writer, who wrote "Rock with You" and "Thriller" and all these tunes. And uh, he gave me an idea, and then I embellished it and made it a little more syncopated by the <laughs> with the bass drum like that. So it was between Rod and I.